Welcome to HMG Live, a production of HMG Strategy, your global partner helping you reinvent the future of work. Home to the HMG Strategy Top Technology Executives to Watch Awards and also offering the HMG Marketplace, a fast, easy, safe, and efficient way to connect with the right vendors for your technology needs. We can't be together at these events, right? But I think the next best thing is being able to connect through the Marketplace. And now, a warm welcome to today's host, Lead Principal and CEO of HMG Strategy, Hunter Muller. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the Portland CIO Executive Leadership Summit. I'm Hunter Muller, Lead Principal at HMG Strategy. My team and I are delighted to be here with you today. Our first ever inaugural event with the Portland uh, Sim Chapter. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, it's an amazing summit we have, a plan, we, have a play, we have a plan here for you today. So big shout out to Ring Central. Uh, today's powered by Ring Central. Ring Central working together from anywhere, bringing employees and customers together with the world's number one business communications platform. Ring Central supports any mode, any device, anywhere. It's easy to use, easy to buy, easy to manage, secure, reliable, and open. 400,000 enterprise customers and partners globally trust Ring Central in their search for the world's easiest meeting platform. So also uh, check out Acera. Acera is a partner of ours in this summit, uh, an interesting AI company. Hey, I'd like to uh, introduce Richard Appiard. Richard, Richard is the CIO of the Oregon State Police and the president of Sim Portland. Uh, Richard, uh, great to see you today. Uh, thanks, Hunter. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Yes. Oh, perfect. I always like to check that because I end up speaking into a, a, a deaf mic. But um, no, it's great to be here. Great to be um, um, for, us for the our chapter, Sim Portland chapter, to be partnered with you on this conference. Very excited about today. Um, just very quickly, yeah, I'm the current president for Sim Portland. Um, we're a uh, professional organization for IT management, senior IT leaders uh, in town. We um, have about 200 members and we have a lot of programming um, for our membership to help them network, keep up to date with um, technology. And also we have other activities like outreach and STEM uh, programs as well. Um, but uh, so I'm very um, excited about uh, today and would welcome people who are interested to learn more about SIM uh, and SIM Portland to go to simpdx.org. And I believe, do we have Mark Taylor on the line as well from That's our correct. SIM National? Yes. That's right. Richard, great to see you. Thanks so much. Hey, Mark, welcome to the program. Hey, Hunter, great to be here today. And I'm so glad to see that you guys have connected uh, with the team in Portland as well. Uh, Richard and the entire a leadership team at the Portland chapter, honestly, have built a, a really dynamic uh, leadership uh, group within the Portland community. And uh, they're making, having a huge impact, uh, Hunter, that ha actually have. They recently received some great uh, rewards, uh, awards from, from the, the local uh, universities in the area, uh, their longstanding relationship, the investment that they've made. So I can't say enough uh, about the Portland chapter. Awesome. Yeah, I guess 200 members. That is strong, right, Mark? Yeah, it really is. It really is. They're, they're among our strongest chapters across the country. And just uh, I can't say enough about what they've done and, and really how they've gone about it. And just a great community of leaders. So those of, that are on the call today, if you're not connected with Richard and the team there, I certainly uh, give you, encourage you to do so. And Hunter, thanks for your continued uh, investment. Great to see you connecting up with the Portland team and, uh, and all you're doing across the country, uh, across, pardon me, across the country you know, for the SIM community. Really appreciate your uh, continuing. Yeah, hey, I love SIM, Mark. I've been a member over 20 years and I would say uh, probably the, in the, my top 10 list of why I've been successful in my professional ascent, I would say SIM's certainly one of those. Thanks, Hunter. Good to, see, to you. see you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and you check out our marketplace. Uh, you'll hear more about it here in a minute, but we have some amazing companies in the marketplace that you cannot find anywhere else. Appian, Ariaka, Dark Trace, Forescale, Globant, Obsidian, PagerDuty, Sonotype, Slack, Tanium, and Tessian. And please help us uh, refine the marketplace. What are your organization's specific cyber and technology needs now? You could 
simply fill in the poll and uh, submit, that'd be great. Thank you. And we're gonna roll a little video, I think, uh, regarding uh, the top technology executives that matter uh, at the end of the song. Later in today's program, HMG Strategy founder and CEO Hunter Muller will proudly recognize and honor global technology executives who matter. These top-tier CIOs, CISOs, and other technology executives have genuinely distinguished themselves in business transformation, digital disruption, innovation, and talent development through even the most difficult circumstances. These awards are not given lightly. They are earned. Recipients join an elite community of forward-thinking global technology executives in the HMG Strategy community. We are delighted to celebrate these exemplary leaders and their teams who have delivered unparalleled value to their organizations, their communities, and our world. Please stay with us for the award ceremony and meet the 2020 Global Technology Executives Who Matter. So exciting program. We've been working on that for over 14 years. Hopefully you can stay to the very end of the program and uh, find out a surprise who we're going to recognize. Thanks for uh, dialing in today and let's, uh, let's get rolling. First up, we have Dutt Kalari. Dutt is the Senior Vice President of the Office of the CIO. Uh, and he's a group CIO, Senior Vice President of Global Technology at Broadridge. Dutt, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hunter. How are you doing? I am awesome. Uh, where are you coming in from today? I'm coming from the great garden state of New Jersey in the East Coast. Okay, so this, this is really, truly a North American summit right now, folks. It is. Think about it. We're going to be bringing people in from diverse points of view, diverse industries, uh, and here right from the East Coast. Uh, a little bit about Broadridge uh, for folks that may not know what Broadridge is. Sure. Again, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here, Hunter. Uh, and congratulations to you and the Portland SIM and the CIO community. Uh, I'm honored to be participating at the inaugural Portland Summit and you know, look forward to continuing the participation with HMG Live. And, and Dutt, you're a new SIM member as well, right? And yes, from SIM New Jersey to SIM uh, Portland, hi and congratulations. Great. Hey, a little uh, bit about Broadridge. It's a really interesting company. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Broadridge Financial Solutions is a four and a half billion dollar global fintech leader. Uh, we are part of S&P 500. We are a leading provider of investor communications and technology driven solutions. And we provide these solutions to banks, broker dealers, asset and wealth managers and corporate issuers. Broadridge provides the important infrastructure that's required to power the financial services industry. And we are very proud to say that the financial industry runs through us. Very exciting. So give us some numbers that are in the public domain. How do you uh, describe, if you're on a marketing or a sales call, how your, your influence on the whole financial services space? Sure. So in the investor communication side, we own about 90% of the market, almost about 6,000 plus corporations rely, us, rely on us and trust their brand to us to do their investor communications. We reach about 95% of the households, which means any statement, financial statement that you would have received probably came from Broadway. On the GTO or the global technology and operations site, uh, we process anywhere between seven and a half to eight trillion dollars of post trade every day. And we also process about four to five million trades every day. Big numbers, wow. Hey, so there are some real mega trends that are going on in our industry, AI, ML, RPA. When you think about the whole architectural stack at Broadridge, and you think about the, the technologies that are on your radar screen, where does RPA and AI line up? Sure, so 
the robotic process automation, as 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 we said in the title, is no more a science fiction stuff, Hunter. We are in there day in, day out using RPA, right? So what that does is, especially in an operation intense organization like ours, like Broadridge, the automation plays a critical role and robotic processing automation definitely plays a critical role. And today I wanted to actually discuss two use cases of how we are using RPA and AI at Broadridge, right? So as I mentioned in the introduction, Broadridge is a leading provider of investor communications. And we send critical pieces of communication to one part of shareholders we call the non-listed users or NLI. And we want them to participate in proxy voting and these communications are sent by using Broadridge's suite of shareholder engagement products. Now, the participation at non-listed users has, has historically been very low. And the reason is because we did not have the reach that is required because of the manual intensity of processing that is involved. We automated that. And what we automated is the creation of reminder jobs or our jobs as we call it in our world and put in a AI enabled process automation, robotic process automation that would automate the creation of these R jobs that would automate, not only automate the creation but the execution of these R jobs on our platforms. And that actually resulted in huge efficiency gains and starting off a entire business line for Broadridge. So you know, Doug, who do you actually go with? Can you share with us the partner that you went with? So we partnered with uh, UiPath as the platform, they provide us the, the orchestration, the creation and the orchestration platform when it comes to, uh, uh, to RPA. Interesting. Hey, Doug, talk to us a little bit about your leadership style, your leadership skills, influencing the business, influencing the C-suite, occasionally presenting to the C-suite and the board. So I see myself as a versatilist. What that means is I am a technology agnostic, function neutral, solution driven architect. That's how I look at myself. And what that requires is, it requires for me to speak in a language I call techlish. English with the business side and technology with the technology side. That triage is critically important in the digital journey. So, articulating the value of technology in business terms to the business and articulating the business need in technology terms to technology is what I do as the collaborator, the coordinator and the change agent right in the middle of my transformation. That's a new one, techlish, I love it. I really, really love it. You know, when you think about RPA and the impact and benefit how do you measure it, right? You have to measure impact, right? So look at the outcomes of our automation, right? When we automated our, uh, you know, uh, the, the NLI processing, as I call it, it actually resulted in developing a new business line for the organization, which means we had to hire more salespeople. See, there is this, misnomer or there is this misconception that RPA may pe put people out of work. No, not really. In our case, it actually increased the number of people, but the type and the skills of people that we had to bring in were slightly different. We had to bring in more analysts. We had to bring in more you know, automation engineers. We had to bring in more data scientists, and we had to bring in 
client relationship managers who understand these aspects well and have the ability to align our business and our technology with our customers. That is a huge business benefit. Now, we also freed some of our people to do things that they love doing. That demonstrated efficiency gains of over 30% in throughput processing. It increased the speed. So the, I, I can go on with these, with these benefits, Hunter. But how do you measure it? Is it roll up into a dashboard uh, of some sort of actual uh, uh, interactions that the RPA, the bot uh, facilitated that? So we actually created a measurement dashboard. Yes, Hunter. And it is this dashboard that collects the underlying data based on how the bots are doing and presents it to us. And that's how we measure our benefits. Very cool. Hey, let's kick it up a level of the discussion, Dot. Is this one of the most interesting times? I'm assuming you're three plus decades into your career. Is it the best time ever to be in our industry for innovation and potential real impact and lift with technology? Absolutely. As a technologist, I feel blessed to be a technologist in this time. And the reason why I think of that, or what, the reason why I feel that way is because we are at the cusp of the digital age. The digital age has already started. And I coined another word called physical. It's the state between the physical and digital. And the people who enable those are technologists with a business mind of mind. So the new age businesses will be powered by technology. And hence, being a technologist in this time of age is a great thing and wouldn't want it any other way. Doug, very, very interesting, very cool. Hey, how would you characterize your leadership style in general and in the pandemic? So I'm a collaborative leader, right? You know, uh, I have to build consensus. I have to build the consensus in, in my teams and make sure, and the way I look at it, Hunter, is I'm first among equals, right? Now with that kind of an approach, pre-con, uh, you know, uh, pre-COVID or pre-pandemic, and during pandemic, I had to change that style. Instead of managing at the task level or the, the program level, I have to start changing my orientation to manage outcomes. Because in a remote working environment, you have to be very empathetic. I call it being human. Being human in a digital age or in a non-human way. Really right? interesting, yeah. And, and if, you, if you look at it, right, the people factor plays a critical role and the interplay between the human and the digital or the, the, the digital labor is extremely important to become a physical leader in managing the upbeat of your team by working very closely with them and at the same time bringing in the digital labor force. That's the leadership style that I'm adopting right now. Love it. Hey, Doug, what's next after RPA for you? What do you see on the horizon that's going to drive massive uh, change and in innovation from a technical point of view in your industry and across industry? As a futurist, I think the natural language processing and deviceless computing or device independent computing is what I see in the future. So let me give you a small example, 30 seconds, right? I will probably be calling my digital assistant to get me a car and a self-driven car without a driver shows up in, my, in front of my, uh, my house and I sit in the car going out. I can use that as an entertainment. I can use it for doing work I can even use it for looking at my health records or my financial records, which means the automotive as a platform will become a centralized integration point for financial services, 
for you know for for your healthcare doesn't matter it should be the common point for every piece of information that you would need to conduct your life that is the future i saw i i see i call that the continuation or the continuum of services and the continuum of services leveraging smart technologies intelligent technologies ar vr and augmented intelligence is the way we are going hey dot you always deliver you you amaze me you're one of my top picks in uh, the fs industry and our whole industry thanks so much for coming on today's program and sharing your experience with our portland friends we'll see you soon thank you very much thanks for having me hunter and wish you all the best and once again congratulations to the portland cios great thanks again what a great interview with uh, dot next up we have uh, a one-on-one -on -one interview we conducted recently with trevor schultz senior vice president and cio of ring central trevor great to see you hey hunter great to see you thank you for having me Hey, so the title of this fireside chat is change to win and the next phase is good to go. What is, what is that all about? Well, you know, I, I think there's a lot of discussion going on right now about what's next. You know, I, I think over the last couple quarters, people have been talking about now and uh, the change that they have to enact now. And I'm more interested in where we have to go next, what the business is asking for us and what a lot of people are calling new normal, next normal, you know, give it a name. Sure, makes sense, a lot of sense. You know, you often talk about the systems of experience. Mm -hmm. Can you define what that means and why is that relevant and importance to uh, the enterprise CIO and tech leader? So I, I think this is a new category in my mind. Um, you know, I, I think everyone is searching for what matters and, and how they uh, affect businesses going forward. And, and I think everyone has sort of heard the systems of record, they've heard systems of engagement, and, and now I'm suggesting a new category called systems of experience. This is a, a new and next evolution of those concepts. And, and I think it's important for digital leaders to grasp uh, this trend. And uh, the way I've been looking at this and the way I, I've been speaking to other digital leaders is, you know, we're in this service economy and the service economy up to this point has been analog and now it's digital. People have been giving it a name, digital transformation and whatnot. And in this whole environment we're in has accelerated uh, these systems of experience. And these are, these are digital platforms that deliver mass service at, at scale. And, you know, if you give it some words, you know, what, what defines the systems of experience? It's something that's hyper-individualized, it's immersive, it's communal, it's enduring. You, you hear people use concepts like omni-channel, but the most important is that it's simple and intelligent. And it, it's driving, I think, a lot of the megatrends that are out there right now. When you think of it, the platform wins, right? The ecosystem wins. And you think of the companies that really master that, they're just dominating in their categories, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can look at uh, examples of what I, I'm categorizing systems experience. Think of, think of like how uh, healthcare is changing, telehealth. Um, think about how people who are looking at working out differently, like Peloton, um, people who are looking for new shopping experiences, things like Stitch Fix and M. Taylor, you know, you can, you can go category after category and what you're seeing are digital leaders who are grasping the systems of experience concept and they're applying it to revenue. They're applying it to customer experience. They're applying it to employee experience. And, you know, we at Ring Central believe that the, this huge shift around business communications is also a systems of experience and it's one that's tied towards the employee. You guys are hitting on all cylinders right now in terms of revenue, customer experience, and employee experience. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit more about what, what do you see? So um, I think all three tie. Um, you know, wh when I'm out talking to executives in terms of what is going on, where are they going, what matters, it, you know, first and foremost, people are talking about the employee. Um, how we have people who are going to be able to work from anywhere. 
how are we going to attract talent in this new blended flexible hybrid work model so if you're hiring the best you have the talent that's looking for this flexibility you you create this this seamless employee experience people who can work from anywhere have digital assets like ring central and others help enable them and then if you have an employee that's engaged and, and it has this seamless environment to collaborate with anyone anywhere anytime it also helps with your customer experience like that engaged employee now can engage in the customer who by the way the customers are uh, you know demanding uh, an experience with a brand and so you know all those things I talked about earlier uh, drive that new customer experience and then uh, so you've got the employees driving the customer and then ultimately it drives revenue I mean the, the companies they're gonna win in the normal that's ahead of us are the ones who are truly grasping what it means to create that that truly mass service experience for the employee for the customer which drives the brand brilliant stuff uh, trevor really great thought leadership there now what what kind of leadership skills does a cio need today and into the future to drive this complete uh, holistic i'll call it ecosystem of thinking yeah, you know, I, I, um, I, I'm out there a lot talking about just, you have to tear up the playbook. You, you have to think differently. Everyone keeps saying that, but I, I truly think that what's happened over the last six months has driven a, a hyper growth, hyper acceleration of what people are looking for out of companies. Um, things that seemed impossible to get done in a year happened overnight. And so you have to be a leader that's continuously learning. You have to be a leader that's willing to look at innovation differently. And you have to really understand what your employees need, what your customers need. You, you have to stop thinking about personas and you have to stop thinking about, you know, classic thinking here. I, I truly believe the, the companies that win are already moving and it takes digital leaders to actually, you know, lean into this new environment. You know, we, I totally agree with you on this piece. I think CIO and the tech leader needs to lead differently, think differently, lead courageously, lead authentically, lead passionately, and really rewrite the rules on and how the CIO, the tech leader, engages with the board, the C-suite, the line of business. What other kind of pieces of advice would you give us, uh, a tech leader now today, thinking about trying to think completely different and re- thinking their leadership style? Oh yeah, I love this question, Hunter. You know, I, 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 I just wanna turn this on its head. You know, people have been talking about IT business alignment, IT business integration, you know, IT getting on the same page with the business. I, I don't think CIOs should be, they, they shouldn't be focused on getting on the same page with the C-suite. And, and what I mean by that is that they need to rewrite the book. They need to collaborate in writing this new book about convergence of all things, technology, people, process, data. They, they shouldn't be trying to understand. They should be leading. And it, it's such a mindset shift. Um, and, and if you don't have this courage to, to take that mindset shift, your, your competitors will. And, you know, we at Ring Central believe that we need to rewrite the book. We need to rewrite the, the what is happening in unified communications and collaboration. And, and that's where people are going to emerge out of this environment we're in right now as true winners, as true leaders of winning brands and winning companies. I love the idea. What does winning really look like then uh, in its fullest form? Winning means that you've created a, a, a beautiful experience for your employees that you've created uh, an exceptional new level of experience for your customers. And those are driving new revenue streams, new ideas. I mean, people are coming to brands now and saying, I wanna connect and I want it to be intelligent. I want it to know who I am. I don't wanna have to tell it that. Our employees are saying that, our, our customers are saying that. And this is a whole brand new way of thinking. So that's what I, I go back to systems of experience. This isn't about creating fancy new workflow. This isn't about creating, you know, uh, you know, buying the right thing. This is about thinking differently about where things are going in the coming years. And I, I challenge everyone 
to start thinking about, it doesn't matter if you're in healthcare, it doesn't matter if you're in manufacturing, every single vertical, every single digital leader in every vertical has to be thinking about systems of experience. And, you know, I'm super thrilled about this, this concept and it's, it's really catching steam. So systems of experience at the end of the day, it comes down to people, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like if I engage and want to buy something, I, I want it to know me. I want it to actually, you know, help me and guide me and stop, you know, stop having me be the one I have to search for it. Cause there's unlimited uh, things that can happen in this environment. And, you know, I, I think that, this, this is just a, a category that's going to emerge, regardless if I give it a name or not. Digital leaders have to change their thinking. They have to really push themselves to go after this type of, of concept. This is the core of how people are driving their businesses, and this is where the winners are going to emerge. Let's talk a little bit about what's uniquely different about Ring Central. I, I'm just so blessed. I work at a company where I, I am in the future. People want to see business communications get simpler. They want it to be seamless. They want it to be reliable. They don't want to have to think about it anymore. They don't want to have to flip between a bunch of different apps and they want to work from anywhere. It's got to be, it works from anywhere on any mode that I just, if I choose. We at Ring Central believe that all of this needs to come together and we're living in the future right now. That truly is unique and you must be working with all sorts of companies across industry and all sizes, right? All sizes. I mean, we work from the small office, home office, all the way up to the Fortune 50. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. We're a company that was born uh, in the phone, and we've moved into video this year. Fortunately, with, with everything going on, that played out well. And, uh, you know, messaging. Most people don't know that we, we also have the messaging platform. So, and it all works in one app. I mean, I, I can flip between all three and not have to change a screen. And I know that seems like, okay, does that make sense? We're the only people who do it. And by the way, we're open. We have an open platform that allows you to integrate your current workflow into our platform. We, we are not a walled garden. We believe that the, the communications and workflow of a company should be everywhere. But we also believe that a tight integration to a platform like ours just makes the employee experience better. Hey, Trevor, I understand people can learn more about Ring Central in the HMG marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. Take a look at the marketplace. I love what you've built there, Hunter. Ring Central's there. Easy to find us. Great to see you, Trevor. Talk soon. Absolutely, Hunter. Always a pleasure, man. Great to see you. Thanks now. Next up, we have Michelle Garvey. Michelle's the CIO of J. Crew. Michelle, welcome to the program. I didn't realize I had to unmute myself, Hunter. Geez, self-service, huh? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Michelle? Yep. I can now. <laughs> great. Hey, it's great to see you, Michelle. You know, you've been such a friend and a fan of the HMG platform and network, probably going on from day one, 14 years ago. When uh, I was really, in high school, yes. <laughs> really enjoy your uh, industry thought leadership. Uh, give us a little context. I mean, you guys are right in the middle of the tsunami, the retail tsunami. Um, I mean, how did the pandemic impact you, your leadership style uh, at J. Crew? Well, let's start with J. Crew. I mean, J. Crew, iconic brand. It's a wonderful brand. Our family of brands includes Madewell, which is also just a, a growth engine that's doing great. Uh, J. Crew had stumbled a bit in 2015 or so, and I was part of the team that came in to kind of put it back on the right track. Part of that, and that's been a great experience. Part of our plan for that was preparing an IPO for Madewell, or at least considering strategic options for our Madewell division uh, as part of you know, where we were planning to take the company. And obviously the uh, pandemic uh, splattered the IPO market and the retail industry in general. So we had to scramble quite a bit uh, as part of that, and in, in our case, Chapter 11 was part of the solution to that. We filed Chapter 11 very early in the pandemic, and we emerged very early as well. So we are back out of Chapter 11 with a stronger balance sheet, uh, good financials, and poised to move forward. But it's just been uh, an incredibly fast-paced series of events going on. I mean, how do, you, uh, how do you lead in such an environment, this hybrid environment where some people are in the office, some people aren't? Uh, you know, what kind of communication the, the, style? 
actually, you know, but first we, we fortunately, we've been investing in IT in collaboration technologies and the ability to work remotely for a while now. So we were very fortunate that we had uh, VDI in place. We had, um, we had VPN technology in place. We had most of our employees already had laptops. So we were able to switch pretty quickly. We literally one week, we said, let's put half the company working from home on Wednesday, half the company working from home on Thursday. Let's test that and see how it works. And Monday we made that everybody works from home permanently. So it was basically a one day test and then it was live um, because that was the nature of how we were doing things. And actually we were well positioned to work 100% remotely. What's been more challenging surprisingly is the partial return to the office. Uh, I wanna draw a picture of how a fashion line is created. Uh, picture a big room with a whole bunch of samples in it and designers talking about, here's my inspiration board. Uh, watercolor pastels are gonna be big and I'm visualizing the flower fields of Givenchy and this is how this translated into this fabric. Look at this beautiful print. I'm gonna use this print on this shirt. I'm gonna use this color from the print in my palette for the, comp you know, for the complimentary things. It's a very interactive process with design showing their inspiration, merchandising saying, oh, I love that. I think that's a great item, but for a small select group, we should only get a little bit of it. Everybody's doing this across the whole assortment in a large room. And now suddenly only four people can be in that room and 45 are on video. That was actually much harder to adopt to, adapt to than having everybody remote. Makes sense, right? Creativity and innovation and collaboration uh, it's really that spontaneous interaction we've lost. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest challenge really of leading in these times is, you know, we have great technologies in place thanks to some of the partners that you've already talked about. But the harder part is the casual interaction. You know, the people you see on your way to the coffee room, the people that you run into in meetings. I have really good uh, interaction with my direct reports and I have really good interaction with the leaders of the biggest projects, but very rare for me to see somebody three or four levels down in the organization the way that I used to. So we are coming up with uh, creative ways to manage that. Uh, we have coffee hours, coffee breaks in the afternoon. We are doing remote video town halls. We're featuring different people. We had a remote Diwali celebration this morning. Happy Diwali, everybody. Uh, with people all around the world on a video call. Uh, we got to see live fireworks, you know, on the video screen, and we got to see people's kids performing dances and singing. And so you, you have to be creative about how you use what you have to recreate those, uh, those relationships and interactions that you don't have the old way. You know, when you think about the life cycle of a remote employee and the, uh, the engagement, how do you keep people engaged? What are the uh, tricks that are working for you given all of your uh, you know, successful years in the business? You know, it's interesting, but we actually found in the remote environment, a higher level of participation in things like the daily standups for the agile teams. Uh, people want that connection and they wanna have that interaction. Uh, and I find that there's a lot of casual conversation at the beginning and ends of meetings. I mean, people are, are grasping for that connection in the places where they can find it. Um, and it's, it's, we, we are, uh, we normally do a Christmas party with a gift exchange and we have it in a kind of funny way where you can steal gifts and everything. And we can't do that this year. So we're having people sign up if they want to be a secret Santa, uh, if they want to be on a gift, a gift, uh, a greeting card tree. We're just trying to create the opportunities but I'll tell you, we also have lots of introverts on the team who are really happy, you know, that they can be left alone to code for a good solid three hour chunk, um, which they didn't used to have. So I actually find productivity is, is better than ever. In That's a way. interesting. That's fascinating. And you're right. Uh, uh, technology people tend to be more introverted than extroverted, right? Well, we have both. <laughs> But the introverts think this is great, right? The extroverts are dying. Like the extroverts, like people who get energy from interacting with other people and are physical and they want to see you and they want to hug you and all that stuff. They're, they're having a hard time. 
uh, and you have to try to make up for that. But the people who who really thrive on alone time are, you know, this is their moment. That's interesting. I really well said. Great, great comment there. Hey, you know, the landscape changed dramatically regarding the threat landscape, the threat map uh, across the enterprise. How are you handling securing this new uh, this new distributed workforce? Well, so my CISO would absolutely leap through my screen and murder me if I named anything in specific. But you know, protecting your endpoints is very critical. Uh, having having that prevention and having rapid detection, uh, and having a really good way to identify the threats that are significant and need to be researched and weed those out from the eight billion other alerts. Uh, that's that's the key. I think in some cases, you know, I think it's important to focus at the front end of the threat landscape, but it's also important to have a robustly thought out network and communication strategy so that you build in security from the ground up. You know, Michelle, um, for those folks that may be getting a little uh, tired in this marathon or soon to be Ironman pandemic, uh, what gives you inspiration and hope that there's a better uh, uh, future for us around the corner? And what inspires you to be a, a world-class technology leader? Well, I mean, the challenge is, it's, I think the same things that always inspire you. What's always inspired me are building tools that bring value to the people that I care about, whether it's my coworkers or my customers or the world, you know, for our, our philanthropical efforts. Uh, there's so much opportunity. There's so much that can be done to make things better. Uh, I, I think the people who are most successful in technology find joy in the work itself and in bringing that value to the people that, that they love. In all this uh, change and, uh, and unknown, uh, are you having fun with the challenges? Um, have you figured out the inner game of making uh, a gaming it so you can have some fun at the same time? Well, you know, yes and no. I think, you know, my husband says it really well. He says it's a limited life, but it's not a bad life, you know? I mean, a lot of, I was a big live music fan. We went to concerts almost every week. I really miss going to concerts. I miss going to Broadway. I miss the energy. I don't miss the commute per se, but I miss the energy of the commute and I miss being with people. Uh, but I get to sleep better, you know, I'm getting more rest now because I don't have to wake up at five in the morning. Uh, I'm, it's so efficient to move from one meeting to the other, you know, on video. I do spend a whole lot of my day on these video calls. Uh, and fun is where you find it, you know. I mean, for, for a while there, I'm sure many of you, like me, didn't even see, you know, our, our children uh, for weeks or months. And that was hard, you know. but I got to learn how to uh, how to turn my children into potatoes and into space aliens on the screen, and that was really entertaining, you know. And and we're sending each other little gifts. Uh, and I'm not speaking to my kids now. I'm speaking about my team as well. You know, we just try to stay engaged and present and be sensitive to what other people are going through. And that is a little more challenging when you're not physically there. It is a little more challenging. Hey, Michelle, thank you so much for coming on our inaugural. Portland Summit and, uh, and uh, showing up for our friends in Portland, Oregon. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Hunter. Great to see you. We'll see, talk to you soon. Yep, thanks. You too. Bye now. Next up, we have Tony Alvarez. Uh, we'll be making the introduction for our next panel uh, panelist, the reality of returning to the workplace. Tony? Hello. Thank you, Hunter. Uh, I'm Tony. As Hunter said, I am the director of programming uh, programs for Sim Portland, and I'm also the vice president of technology for Gear Up Sports. Um, I get the terrific pleasure of introducing today's panel, our roundtable panel. I would like to spend 10 minutes introducing each of them because they are so uh, accomplished and interesting folks, but I'm going to try and keep this short and uh, give you a quick highlight and then turn it over to our moderator. Um, first on the list is Ben Berry. This is in no particular order. Uh, innovative IT leader in both the public and private sectors. Ben is the Vice President of Information Technology and CIO for Bonneville Power Administration. He's also the founder and CIO of Airship Technologies Group Endurance Unmanned Vehicles. 
Um, welcome, Ben. Nancy Winslow. Nancy serves as CIO for Equinix, providing digital platform for a variety of industries. Industries. Um, she previously was the CIO of Propel Insurance and is a truly dynamic and fun technology leader. Sabi Verdich, an energetic and inspirational leader and speaker. Sabi currently serves as a CIO for Clackamas Community College, speaking four languages. Sabi is recognized internationally as a speaker, trainer, and coach. Welcome, Sabi. Uh, Jordan, must, oh, I'm sorry, Megan, my goodness. Megan Douglas, a true up and comer. Megan is the CIO for Asina Retail Group, a multi billion dollar retailer for women and girls, I believe the largest in the United States, with brands like Ann Taylor, Lane Bryant, Justice, and others. Uh, Megan was a consultant for Anderson, has held senior technology roles at Target and Best Buy. Welcome. And our distinguished moderator, who I will be turning it over to, a 30-year veteran in IT. Jordan has led software and information technology teams in delivering complex platforms and integrations. Jordan's currently the CIO of the Public Employees Retirement System. And I am going to turn it over to you, Jordan. Um, thank you all. And in Enjoy the round table. I do believe that the questions will be being fed to you, the audience, so that you can consider your own answers uh, to this interesting topic. What does returning to work mean to you? Um, Jordan, I hand it over to you. Great, thanks for those inter great introductions, uh, Tony. So um, again, my name is Jordan Sanga. I am the CIO for uh, the state of Oregon public employee retirement system, been there for 18 years, and I've been a SIM member for seven years. So today I'm honored to serve as the moderator uh, for, very, for four very distinguished uh, panelists that will offer different perspectives on how they're leading the organizations to the new next. So um, as Tony mentioned, if you have any questions during the session, go ahead and post them to the chat window. Um, and then uh, we will be posting po the questions I'll be asking through the chat window as well, so you can follow along. So, okay, we have a lot to unpack in the next uh, half hour, so let's get started. Um, so, panelists, tell us about your organization um, and how your workplace was set up before the pandemic and what's happening now um, during the pandemic. And, uh, and also mention whether you have employees working mostly from home and how that's working all for you. So let's start with Nancy, then Megan, then Ben, and then we'll save the last for Savvy. Go ahead, Nancy. Hi, thank you, Jordan. I'm Nancy, it's nice to be here with you today. So I think all of our organizations are challenged and maybe some differently than others. So I'll kind of highlight um, areas that might be a little bit different for us. We are an international organization and so dealing with a pandemic across the globe is very interesting as each you know, country has had different outbreaks at different times and had started some of our going back to work in places like Amsterdam, um, only to find that that was uh, relatively short lived. And so um, being international has been very, very interesting. We are also in a business that we have physical data centers that have to have, um, people able to access them. So we have critical essential workers that have had to work the whole time and stay going into our IBXs because of the services that they provide to lots of organizations. Um, but we also have a very big workforce that has been able to work remotely. And so we have had the opportunity to do both. Uh, very critical and essential workers who have had to go to work every day. We've done things like uh, different payment systems and offering employees um, additional benefits that are staying at home and need additional equipment. Uh, many of you have probably been dealing with the challenge of not being able to find cameras to put on your uh, desktops because everybody suddenly went to the Zoom world. And so we've struggled with some of those same things. But um, our challenge, I think, has been that we have had both. We've had very critical and essential workers that have had to work every day and keeping them safe and also having a distributed workforce and just being able to get everybody up and working. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, thanks, Nancy. Megan? 
Yeah, thanks. Nice to be here. So um, I'm the CIO for Athena Retail, um, as Tony said. And so as you can imagine, we have a lot of different types of employees. So we have store employees, distribution center employees, corporate employees, international offices. So one of the things we've really learned in this is there's not one size fits all. There's a different situation depending on geography and type of work. Um, and so because we're also a multi-brand company, we had multiple offices already and shared service offices. So we were already used to doing a lot of video conference calls. Um, but what we found is uh, when sort of we went to the pandemic and we moved from a corporate perspective to everyone working remotely, we actually found a lot of improvements in that previously you'd have two people on the phone, you'd have some people in a conference room, um, multiple locations, side conversations, rustling of paper. And so I would say our corporate office has really found a lot of benefit in everyone on a level playing field being in remote working like this. And so we've seen a lot of benefit that we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, and we're still, from a corporate perspective, we're still all remote. Um, so we're trying to think about how do we take some of the advantages that we found in this new way of working when we someday in the future go more to hybrid. And then obviously for our associates that are required to be in person, so distribution center, fulfillment center, for our store employees, doing everything we can to create a sense of safety um, around those essential workers. Thanks, Megan. So what well, the next is Ben. I know Ben, you have probably one of the largest organizations. So tell us about your organization. Well, thank you, Jordan. And thanks for having me here at HGM Live. Um, Bonneville Power Administration is part of the Department of Energy. So we are one element, one of the largest elements in DOE. Uh, we serve the Pacific Northwest. So we are in Montana, Oregon, Washington, Idaho. And for Bonneville, um, the, the pandemic really was a a change, the game changer for us um, back in early March when we all had to move from uh, working inside the buildings to working virtually. And this was not that difficult for IT because we had always had uh, processes for inclement weather. So we could always have about 2000 people working off site at their homes. But now we were faced with about 4,000 people. Um, but with the way we had architected our VPN, our virtual private network, and making use of my PC really allowed this workforce of about 4,000 to immediately the very next day move to a virtual environment without uh, missing a beat. So we serve 142 electric companies. Uh, we don't sell power to the consumer. But we sell it to these electric companies. And we have about 31,000 grid miles of electric grid miles in the Pacific Northwest so that business can continue going. Great, thanks, thanks, Ben. So Sabi, tell us about the organization. Absolutely, no, I'm very excited. Well, thank you, Michelle, for saying happy Diwali. It's, you know, the one of the biggest festivals in India. So happy Diwali to all friends and families. And, we couldn't have picked a better date, November 13th, the Friday, right? So to have this uh, conversation today. Uh, I'm the CIO at Clackamas Community College. We serve about, uh, I would say about approximately 23, 24,000 students, which is, uh, it's among the highest, uh, one of the largest uh, community colleges in uh, Oregon among 16. Uh, we have about 1,000 employees, uh, 500 to 600 are full-time and then rest of them are part-time. So a really decent size in terms of employees and in terms of students. I will say pre-pandemic, uh, most of the folks were on site, right? We have three campuses in Portland metro area, uh, Oregon City, uh, Milwaukee and Westland. So folks were working primarily on site and that was quite a shift when you ask everybody, you need to go to a remote site. So what, what we did was we issued a lot of laptops, I think, uh, close to 500 laptops were issued to all those full-time employees. Uh, the biggest challenge has been for students. Uh, how can they adapt with moving all those classes online? And right now, I think 90% of the work which we're doing is online, but there are still few classes which we can't have uh, on online. Like we have automotive classes, automation, uh, 
plumbing classes are there, healthcare classes. Yeah. Those all need to be on site. So we are making sure that folks, when they're coming to these campuses, they are safe. They're may, you know, we have increased our sanit sanitization processes so that we're keeping our uh, faculty and the students safe at the same time. Great. Thanks, Sabi. So that's a good segue for our next question for the panelists. So as we look into uh, returning to the workplace, uh, what are your plans to change your change your office configuration? Are you looking at canceling or setting up new leases? Are you downsizing, upsizing? Uh, tell us a little bit more of that. Um, let's start with Megan this time. Yeah, so we we're definitely making changes to the the physical workspace, and so part of our thinking is that because we've had so much success working remotely, we're not in a rush to get back into the office. And so number one, we'll continue to work remotely as long as we feel like that's the best thing to do for associates. Um, and especially those locations with high real estate costs, we're looking at downsizing opportunities and we'll be shifting a lot to hoteling, some collaborative spaces people can come into for meetings, but a lot less uh, individuals with assigned work locations. So not something that we feel like we're in a rush to move to, but there'll definitely be a different physical atmosphere when we eventually get back to the new normal. All right, thank, thanks, Megan. So Ben, uh, what, what are your plans to return to the workplace? Are you making any oh, changes? Well, as you can imagine in four states, Bonneville has a number of facilities, number of buildings, but this really represents the opportunity to look at what we were leasing in terms of large scale leases and how might we consolidate the workforce that may in fact um, not all return back into the offices. Uh, there'll be a sure, sure in terms of workforce returning, there'll be a number of people coming back. We, we believe that once it's safe and when, once the vaccines are available, but we also think there's a segment of our workforce that are proving that they can actually work remotely uh, from their homes. And so leased buildings are the first thing we're looking at. How do we reduce those? Also in our headquarters, um, having multiple floors in our headquarters in, in, in Portland, maybe there's the opportunity to lease one of the floors to a third party organization to save on lease uh, cost expenses. So we're, we're looking at that from our facilities group, but of, all, of course, all the service organizations have to kind of chime in as well. So IT has to be at the table as well in terms of what kinds of yeah. changes in our IT services might that mean for not only the people who uh, will be consolidating, but for the folks who are in existing locations, make sure that their services don't decline as we do any consolidation. Very good point, Ben. Uh, Sabi. Yeah, well, you know, almost all the three campuses we own that. So nothing in terms of leasing, we're not looking for, uh, you know, reducing any lease since we can't do it. But definitely there are some talks about how can we, uh, since most of the classes will be online or folks are not coming, how can we outsource or give those spaces out for event or anything like that? How can we look at that as, well, as part of the innovation approach? This is also a great opportunity to look at our uh, carbon footprint and uh, at our campus and see how can we reduce it. What are some of those opportunities where there's some build buildings or some infrastructure which we haven't, you know, upgraded in so, in uh, in so many years? How can we start upgrading some of these classes for students when they come back? Uh, there are conversations going on. When we're gonna come back, it's gonna be a hybrid model, right? It's not gonna be 100% coming back. We're just, we're seeing some good benefits of uh, folks working from home. But what does those benefits look like? We're, we're trying to uh, put pencil and number in there, right? Well, in, in terms of dollar amounts, what we have seen is in the last, I will say about six months, we have saved close to half a million dollar in terms of just utility costs when folks are not on campus. So we are looking at those numbers to say, okay, what makes sense when we want to come back, right? What does, what does that social distancing look like? Well, how are our conferences are going to look like? How are classes going to look like, right? When you have some folks, some students who are going to be on campus, some students are going to be online. How can an instructor teach that hybrid class? That's some of the challenges which you are looking at right now. Thanks, Sabi. I know you have some challenges with those different modalities you have to deal with. Uh, so the next question is, um, what are your plans for instituting measures to keep your employees safe? 
and to, pre to prevent any outbreaks occurring in your workplace? And how will you maintain employee well wellness? Um, Megan? Yeah, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, and so I, you know, kind of addressed this earlier in that I think for us, it's really not a rush to get back into the corporate office. And we do have a lot of different things in place for our store and distribution associates regarding masks and sanitation and social distancing. I think one of the other things that um, we've started to talk about is also mental health and something that we're all going through with We've essentially gone through this sort of trauma of the world getting turned upside down and different people have different at home situations where some people have kids at home, some people have aging parents that they're worried about and can't visit. And so I think it's acknowledging the mental health component that all of our associates are facing and what are things that we can do and put in place for associate resource groups um, access to different um, people to talk to, different training. We recently had an hour where we had a mental health expert come in and talk to whomever in our corporate office wanted to hear about sort of meditation approaches and reducing stress. And I, so I do think that is a, a really critical component not to lose sight of. While we obviously have physical safety concerns that we um, need to watch out for. You make some really good points there, uh, Megan, the mental health aspect. Uh, sometimes you forget about that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, ben, what are your plans for instituting measures to keep your employees safe? Well, keeping our employees safe is the number one safety factor that we must con continue with and, and are. Uh, we initially worked through our incident management team even before uh, by having uh, training exercises on what would happen if we had a natural disaster? Well, lo and behold, we had a natural <laughs> yeah. disaster called COVID. And so we didn't miss a beat bringing that IMT team together, making it the focal point for all communications around the pandemic and safety for employees. And we merged that along with our policy group of executives that we meet with uh, once a week at Bonneville. Uh, that allows all the information to be shared in terms of how we're doing of metrics for our four states that we operate under uh, in terms of the numbers of cases, how many actually are contracting the virus um, and how many deaths uh, the, the, the states are having. So we kind of put ourselves in the pilot uh, seat of knowing where we are going it was as we're flying through this pandemic. And we established three different levels of the pandemic. So level three was really um, everybody out of the pool, everybody out of the buildings. Uh, only mission essential function employees were going to remain, principally in our control centers, uh, one in Vancouver, one in Monroe. And we wanted to really uh, protect those folks because those folks are the key individuals who are running the grid for the Pacific Northwest. You take those folks out, then yeah. all the businesses in this area uh, will fail as well. So that's where one area that we're really protected from. The next level down is the 2A level where we're able to bring about 10% of the workforce back into the organization. And then we eventually we get to 2B where we can bring about 25% in. And eventually we get down to level one where we're, it's, it's back to normal operation. So I think the structure is good to have repeatable uh, opportunities for success. But I also think each of our managers, uh, we are checking in with our teams. So for example, a CIO, Every morning at 8.30, I have a check-in meeting, a CIO stand-up meeting with my direct report managers and some of their key uh, people. That gives us a semblance of family, of awareness, of, of meaningful conversation. I always start those conversations off with, does anyone have an overarching theme they want to talk about this morning? Yeah. It can be about business, technology, or just personal. <laughs> because I do see that group as a family that I want them to depend on each other uh, going forward. And mental health uh, is very important, just like we talked with Megan. Um, and my one-on-ones, sometimes I'll talk about, how are you feeling? How are you doing? How are your teams doing? And we do the same thing with our IT town halls. So that's pretty much where we are. Excellent, Ben. Uh, I appreciate that whole um, structure of phasing in the return of your employees. It sounds like a, 
a good a good thing to have. Um, so, Sabi, what's what's your thoughts on this one? Absolutely. You know, we are saving a lot of money in terms of uh, uh, not only the college, but also as individuals, right? We don't have to travel. So we're saving money on gas. We're saving money in terms of parking, right? If somebody's parking like downtown, that's that's a lot of, but also health and happiness, you know, where, the, where you have the ability to not commute. That's such a great factor. But yeah. at the same time, it's affecting, as Megan said, you know, mental health, issues. We Last time I saw news like 200% increase in depression in, in terms of, you know, calls which folks are getting. That's, that is such a, a valid and concerning number in there because we as humans love to socially interact. I know there are introverts and extroverts and Michelle, you know, talked about that saying, hey, and what I say uh, is uh, for introverts, this is dream, their dream come true. But for extroverts, it's their worst nightmare, right? So that's a big challenge right there. So one, one of the things which I'm doing with my team is how can I put a metric in there? So I basically, I use a tool called Mentimeter. And once a month, I pose these three questions on a scale of zero to 10. So my very first question is, hey, what is your stress level? And then, you know, you see that number and then we have a conversation. How can we reduce that level? So, but because once we have that number, we know how we as an organization are doing or how we as a team are, is doing. Second question I uh, usually ask is, do you have the, I, basically, I, do I have the tools to support this organization? And that also is a zero to 10 kind of a, a number in there. And is the team working well together? What are those issues? So that metric, I think, gives me some kind of a baseline to work upon and uh, start putting some things in place. You know, more check-ins, you know, more meditation, uh, giving them access to, uh, we have uh, employment access uh, 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 support group, which you could be used when, whenever there are challenges. So that's, that's uh, I think, is helping uh, within the team, but also having those conversations as, Ben said one-to-one, one-to-ones or during an, even your team meetings, how are you doing, right? How are you, are we celebrating some things? What are your concerns? So connecting with your teams, listening to them and taking an action, that, that is so important. Those are great answers, all of you. Uh, you know, one thing I, I noticed in my own, own organization is um, a lot of folks are not taking their time off. So they're paid time offs because there's nowhere to go. Um, so a lot of folks are starting some feeling some burnouts um, that feel like they're being overworked because they're not taking that break. So when you have those one-on-ones uh, encouraging them to take those time offs, they deserve it. Um, they need to unplug and recharge. So, um, so thank you for all those responses. Um, the next question um, is really about uh, a hybrid workforce. I heard Megan and also most of you guys are planning for a hybrid workforce. So what do you think, uh, what are some of the things you can improve with a partial ro remote workforce? And most importantly, how do you think that's gonna affect your organization cu culture? Culture is very important. You wanna keep that. Um, so uh, interested in some of your answers. Let's start with, uh, actually we haven't heard from Nancy for a while. So Nancy? So this is another great question. I'm going to interject one thing on the other topic. Um, we're seeing a lot of our workforce wanting to relocate. I don't know how many of you are starting to hear that from your folks. And so when we think about real estate, not from a commercial perspective, lots of our teams are now um, finding that they can live in maybe cheaper areas of the country because if they're remote, that doesn't make as big of a difference. So we're starting to entertain what that's going to look like. But I think it is a perfect segue into this question, which is it gives us an opportunity to get talent that we may otherwise not have had the opportunity to get. Yeah. So you can get talent from um, other parts of the country in a remote workforce. It's easier to bring teams together where Often we maybe thought about them needing to have some physical proximity to us, even if they didn't work rem remote 100% of the time. So I think that's going to change our cultures and how we're bringing people together. We have had um, new experiences in onboarding. I'm sure all of you have done the same thing. We're an international company. And again, we would bring folks together physically when they were onboarded and come to our corporate office and meet the executives. And so now to do that, 
um, time zones make a huge difference, right? Somebody in Australia is, you know, onboarding at the same time as somebody in Seattle. And so we've tried to find ways of still bringing all of them together, even if it's a little bit late in one place and early in the other, so that they can still have those interactions. But I think it's going to expand our opportunity for talent. So looking in the positive column. And I also think that it's teaching us how to be more collaborative that way, which maybe expands how great we can be in a future state. Excellent. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, Megan, what are your thoughts on that question? Yeah, I think it'll be interesting um, to have sort of a, a mix and one of the opportunities for hybrid working and who's remote and who's in the office. And there's sort of opportunities to create cohorts essentially. So, um, and Michelle kind of touched on this in the retail space, there's designers and merchants who want to feel the clothes, see the product line put together and it might make sense for specific roles like that. And if there's a need for them to be in the office and collaborate, and then there's a big portion of associates, IT being one of them, that really don't have to be in the office. And so I think as we're doing the hybrid, it's really, there will probably be a large group of IT associates who want to go in, but if it doesn't translate well to I need to be in the office to collaborate with certain people and there's sort of a functional alignment to it, then we'll probably encourage them to continue to be remote. So I think at the end of the day, it's gonna be all about flexibility. Every individual's role is in a different position. And as leaders and managers, we're gonna to have to have a lot of flexibility with ourselves that the team might be spread out in different situations, personal or professional, that work the best for them and sort of evolve over time as we figure it out. Excellent, thank you. So Ben, what, what are your plans uh, for, for hybrid workforce? Well, the hybrid workforce question is front and center at Bonneville uh, because of all the success we've had with people teleworking from their homes. But we have a new nuance with this. Uh, it's not just the telework or situational telework that we used to do. Now it's the question about remote worker. And so the definition of a remote worker is someone who really does not live in our four states. They could live anywhere in the US, on the East Coast, or down South or Texas, you name it, um, but still be a Bonneville employee. And we have a task force within our human resources uh, group, HCM, human capital uh, group. And they're looking at working with each of the lines of businesses on what matters most for how we would roll a remote workforce option out for hiring. Now, there's two things involved in the remote workforce. Yes, it gives the opportunity for people who, are, who already work at Bonneville to move someplace uh, and still retain their job. So there's the retention aspect of keeping people who we love and care for and they do the same for our business. And yet if they wanna move to New York they would be able to do that. And then the other hand is we would be able to get people in who have talent that we may not have been able to, to get here on the West Coast in the Pacific Northwest. So the recruitment for a remote workforce uh, person uh, actually put, pays dividends to bringing in uh, ever uh, increasing talent that may not have considered working for some organization Bonneville in the Pacific Northwest. So it's really a two-sided question that we're trying to resolve. Uh, last week, we itemized all the different job classic classifications we have, and we identified which job classifications would be acceptable for the remote workforce. Now, as CIO, I, I gotta be on, in the building, so <laughs> I'm not gonna right. be a remote worker. <laughs> but <laughs> if you're doing software development, if you're doing project management, if you're a quality uh, a QA person, or if you're working with the IT help desk, those are primary uh, opportunities to have a remote worker uh, be supplied as one of your members or several of your members on your team. So that's where we are. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for uh, distinguish distinguishing between uh, wor uh, the remote worker as well as your um, work folks that work from home. Uh, Sabi, I want to give you the chance to respond to this question. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, you know, the biggest challenge which we're seeing right now and probably in the future will be the collaboration between different team members, right? Uh, if they are working on business requirements or uh, managing a project or they're, they're working together as a team, what are some of the processes which we can put in place to increase that collaboration, right? Tools are there, but what kind of tools can we standardize on, right? When, when we need to define those requirements. So we are having conversations around that. Um, also some of the things which we are looking at is uh, what, why somebody needs to be in the office, right? So if we're looking from technology perspective, we're still taking uh, doing our backups on tapes where somebody needs to be there to, you know, have those backups on tapes. How can we look into automating that and maybe doing backups in the cloud? So we're looking at from those options as well. Um, also from uh, another perspective, which is a human perspective, which, which, is, which is a very interesting problem, which I'm seeing right now is we're a union shop. So we have IT folks who can work from home. Then we have facilities folks who need to come to the site. So there is this, this, this um, this discontentment among the employees that you know you can work from home but I can't although we're getting the similar kind of pay so I, I I deserve a special stipend or special something uh, as part of my pay because they're union which is a very interesting problem which well, it just came along about a month ago and we string trying to figure out what what does that right solution looks like for that Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Sabi, for that perspective. Okay, we're uh, towards the end of the session. Um, I've got a couple more questions if you guys can just hang on. Um, so many organizations have a new appreciation for rapid digital transformation, such as work from home. And we also heard some of the uh, uh, thoughts from Trevor uh, when Hunter interviewed him earlier. Um, so for you, how will you make the best of this new reality to communicate with other leaders within your own organization on IT and or security priorities? Um, Nancy, would you care to respond on that one? So I think what the pandemic has done for lots of us is it's highlighted how important it is for us to be resilient and flexible. You know, we've always talked about IT being agents for change, and I think you know, Trevor touched on it when he said, we're doing a year's worth of projects overnight. Things that we thought were so monumental, we have had to figure out so quickly. Um, and I think it's teaching us that how we're communicating with the leaders. I also loved what Trevor talked about when he said this difference between business and IT and how we learn, we are all one. I mean, the business is IT and it has probably come to light in such a meaningful way. So I think communicating with other leaders now, it's, we are the business, security is everyone's business. You know, uh, when you touch on how important all of our endpoints are, Michelle brought that up. Endpoints now are with so many people that, you know, maybe didn't have to worry about that before. And so all of us coming together and knowing it's everybody's responsibility, but I think it has been very unifying. I mean, Agile was such an overused word maybe in IT uh, before the pandemic, but agile is really everything now. How quickly can we get things implemented from a security or just a work from home perspective? And so I think it's been a real opportunity for us to shine, but I also think it's been a real opportunity for us to become sort of one with the business. And um, that's really what we're seeing in communication. We require everyone to be on video in every meeting now. And I think all of you can appreciate yeah. that. You know, I think Megan, you touched on that earlier, like calling in a couple people was just so uh, almost off-putting. And now you can see everyone's face and you engage so differently than calling in on just a phone call. So I think it's really made us collaborate in a really meaningful, unique and different way. And I think that we'll take, I, I hate the term new normal. I'm like in our, in when we move forward, that's maybe what I will say. Um, I think that we're gonna have so many good positives that we've sort of had to learn by, you know, baptism by fire, I guess. Excellent, thanks. Thanks for that very thoughtful response, Nancy. So Megan, um, what, what what are your plans for, um, you know, how how you're going to handle this whole 
digital transformation within an organization? Yeah, I think Nancy it was really well said um, that um, I think it was easy for the business to sort of point the finger at IT for a lot of things and just probably misunderstanding. And this is sort of one of the positives that come out of this whole situation is it's IT's time to shine. And suddenly we were in the forefront of a ton of conversations because we had disaster recovery preparedness and we had all these technologies in place. And we were for the most part already using the tools and leading a lot of it. So we were a department that others could look at for how you operate in a, a more remote environment. So I'm certainly taking advantage of that to have a seat at the table and that we can be one of the leading strategic parts of the conversation and team where in the past we kind of fell into a order taking bucket. Um, and so I think it's just, um, seizing on that opportunity and, and leaning into, we can really be a part of driving strategically the direction of our companies. Excellent, thank you. Ben. Well, I think the IT role has always played a critical point with our customers, uh, making sure we were providing them the services and the tools uh, to do their jobs at the right time. And the pandemic really drove this home. You know, we were kind of lucky in that uh, just before the pandemic, we had a IT computer refresh program going on. So we were we hadn't refreshed our computers for six and seven years, and these things were getting slower and slower and slower. And we got through about eighty percent of those uh, new computer installs and refreshes, uh, and then the pandemic hit. Well, we had had a, a crucial conversation with our customers as to what their needs were before the pandemic. And many of them said, well, we need laptops, we need, uh, or, or desktops. And so I think now if we ask the people the same question now, <laughs> it would be, we need more laptops <laughs> or for virtual communication. It's one thing to use your VPN and, and make it look just like the network when you're sitting in the office. It's another when they're using their own PC with a tool like my PC, which doesn't have all the functionality of the VPN, and so there, you know, there are haves and have nots. And so where we need to go is have a second conversation now with our customers as to what their needs are going into the future, especially since we know what a pandemic looks like. You know, there's always increasing cost of information availability in terms of people wanting more applications, more data, more systems online. The dichotomy is the fact that the ability to de deliver those services is shrinking due to our budgets. And so at one point we have more requests chasing fewer resources. So there's always this gap between the demand for services and the supply of services. That gap seemingly has grown, not just with our organization, but a number of organizations that have IT uh, embedded. So we have to figure out ways of working smarter with our customers, anticipating what their needs are, especially given what we've seen in the pandemic. And so that we can move, um, we can move closer with our customers going forward into the future. Thanks, Ben. So we're up against time, but I want to give Sabi the last word on this on this last <laughs> question. Go ahead, Sabi. Thank you. I'll be short. I know you know uh, one thing which we're looking at because I'm also a CISO for Clackamas Community College. So information security is upfront for me and very core. Uh, looking at technology is one perspective, but also educating our users is a huge part of that. So we have started this training program. We've started these, uh, started doing these phishing simulations. And last month was Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So we did a lot of communication out to all our folks, students, you know, our customers, our stakeholders, our business, so that educating them, because we as humans are the weakest link in any breach. So uh, that's our one of the biggest focus. Thank you, panel. And I'm going to transfer this back to Hunter. Go ahead, Hunter. Hey, Jordan, great job. And it, panelists, what, what a great job, folks. Just one last comment. Best time ever to be in technology? Savi? For sure. Nancy, Megan, Ben? I think so. Yeah. Absolutely. It, you know, it's it's almost like if you can just take a you know big sigh and say, wow, I, we picked the best career ascent career track, right? So, so Hunter, it also depends upon who you are. It might be lights and, you know, like dear lights, like, are you ready for it? So there is no playbook. So you should have courage 
to lead during these challenging times. So, you know, that's also important piece right there. Courage is important that's, specifically right now. I could yeah. agree with you hundred percent. Hey, really appreciate all of your active engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. Hey, next up, we have the Innovation Accelerator, an inside look at cool new tech. This is a really interesting idea we've had, folks. This is bringing uh, cool, innovative entrepreneurial founders, CEOs to you, straight to you via HMG Live. Uh, so you can literally write it in your laptop, write it right in your home, write your office. You can see, get an inside look at Silicon Valley and how CEO founders work. First up is Michael Feaster. He's the co-founder and CEO of UserMind. Michael, great to have you. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah, great to be here. Thank you so much. Okay, Did, is it M Michelle? I'm sorry, is it Michelle or Michael? It's, uh, it's all right. It's I apologize. A, it's, a challenging, it's a challenging spelling, it's all right. No, nope, right. you know what, it's, uh, I should have had that. My apologies. Hey, mm -hmm. a little bit about UserMind. What is the uh, issue, Michelle, that you're addressing in the enterprise, the layer? Yeah. And what did you see? The How do you see the opportunity and yeah. how big is the market? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I've been, I've been working in my space for seven years and, you know, we've been, you know, blessed to be recognized now by Forrester as a leader in an emerging market called Journey Orchestration. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you so much. So, so much hard work uh, went into that one. Uh, but, but really the shift is we, we've seen essentially most MarTech, most customer engagement platforms are really designed to acquire new customers. Um, and especially within COVID, we're just seeing a new set of priorities emerge for the digital organization around retention marketing and lifetime engagement. So user mind essentially think about us as like the conductor of a symphony, right? An orchestrator. We connect your data lake, all of your customer data into your customer channels and think beyond marketing. Think like real-time digital experiences, the call center, the CRM, you know, all your MarTech, your ad tech. And we essentially orchestrate more personalized, more relevant experiences so the customers stick with you. Um, and, and ultimately the financial metric we drive for our customers isn't really just engagement, it's driving up the lifetime value of that customer relationship over days, months, weeks, years. And so we think this is just a pretty big, a pretty big gap in the existing customer engagement stack. And um, you know, COVID has been a dramatic accelerator for our business. And Michelle, uh, how big is the market? Uh, and oh. what, kind of what kind of clients do you work with now? It's a great question. So we think all up the market is like six to eight billion. You know, you could build much more than a public company. You know, we see a exact target Marketo Pardot size type company. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, our early movers, the segments that have moved first around uh, this kind of retention type engagement uh, are really your highly regulated industries who have long term customer relationships. So think about financial services, commercial and retail banks, mortgages, uh, insurance, um, healthcare, utilities, telco, um, th those have really been all of our large customers. Um, and we, and we, if anyone's sitting out there, you're thinking about, does it apply to me? You know, we find orchestration works better and delivers more value at scale. So our customers tend to be, you know, public companies, let's say a billion up in revenue. And the more products you have, the more geographies you have, the more channel touch points you have the more benefit you can get from implementing a, a retention marketing or retention engagement stack. Very cool stuff. Stay with us, Michelle. We'll circle back here in just a minute. Next, next up, we have Nikhil Gupta. Nikhil is the co-founder and CEO of Armor Code. Nikhil is a, a serial entrepreneur. He's had several exits already. Nikhil, welcome to the program. Uh, thanks, Hunter, for the introduction. Uh, and, you know, it's been a great panel so far. Uh, so, you know, at Armor Code, we are simplifying application security. Um, as, you know, Michelle mentioned that, you know, COVID has a lot of lasting impact on a lot of businesses. And, you know, that's one of the big reasons I decided to, you know, start the company in the midst of COVID. So we just started like four months ago. We just closed our seed round of funding and uh, we are simplifying the application security. Uh, as we talk to, you know, CIO, CISOs and everybody else, and, and just a simple question, how many applications do you have, let alone their security posture? And, you know, you will get myriad of examples, right? So there's no easy way to get those answers. And that's the problem we have start to solve. Uh, you know, we just launched our beta last week. It's been four months, a great ride. And, uh, you know, we have some uh, large POCs undergoings, got some quotes out. So super excited. 
So to kill the exact issue relative to the security landscape that you're addressing is? It's in the application security, right? So at the end of the day, when people are talking about digital transformation and you have the various tools, which is network security, you have email security, but everything is a software at the end of the day. So, you know, you could hack hackers who are kind of, uh, kind of hacking your software, right? And how you write the code. So that's the closest to, you know, where the biggest problem can lie. And, and so that's where we're getting you visibility at that level so that, you know, and especially like 20 years ago when I was at Bell Labs, I used to write code for nine months. There was one release a year and three months, uh, the application security used to do all the testing and everything. And now fast forward 20 years, now the applications are coming out in nine days or nine hours. Now at that pace, and you, it's no longer, you know, it's just the big companies or the small companies, every company you're talking about, like whether it's Fortune 10, Fortune 50 or Global 5000, everybody has this problem. And so that is where uh, the tools which were built to solve these problems are like, you know, 10 to 15 years old, most of them, right? Because that's how the waterfall methodology used to be. Now the whole thing is, Shil was talking about agile or in the panels we are talking earlier, agile and everything. So that's coming to fruition. Everybody's talking about that. And how do you secure the software at the speed of software development? And that's like, you know, multi-billion dollar problem. And, and that's where, you know, we kind of excited to get in. Thanks, Nikhil, for coming on the program. Great to see you again as well. Absolutely. We'll circle back to you here in just a minute. Next up, we have Sarath Narahana. Narani. No, not even close. Apologies. Uh, it's a Friday. I only can say it's a Friday afternoon, guys. So we have to work with it, what we have. Co-founder and CRO of Observe AI. Sarath, welcome to the program. Thank you, Hunter. Uh, again, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sharad. Uh, I think what we've tried building at Observe is essentially a uh, uh, an agent enablement platform. Uh, um, I think most of you would have seen customer experience technologies being built over the last two decades. Uh, and we figured out that if you have to solve for customer experience, probably the silver bullet lies with enabling the agent uh, who's supporting end customers in a contact center. So essentially we built in uh, a platform which can essentially make call center agents a better version for, uh, for themselves. Uh, we operate in a, uh, luckily in a $400 billion uh, targeted addressable market uh, the spend today in contact centers is that massive and uh, uh, and with COVID happening, there's been an acceleration of that spend going from uh, human to technology uh, and, and we've been uh, recipients of that. Uh, we've had a blowout year. We've had uh, a 6x growth in revenue uh, and customer acquisition. Uh, we've raised about $90 million in venture capital funding, uh, the latest round coming in from Menlo. Um, and, uh, we've again invested most of that capital into R&D because at the core, we essentially have built a platform to extract customer conversations uh, from audio and uh, omni-channel. And, and that's what we've set out to do. Hey, uh, Shrath, who was your first uh, funding? Uh, where's your first funding from? So we first raised capital from Y Combinator. This was three years ago. Uh, and then it was with Nexus Venture Partners. And then it was scale late last year. And then a uh, few months ago, it was through Mendo. Oh, congratulations. It just sounds like you guys are on fire. Great job. Thank you. I'll circle back here in just a minute. Uh, next up, we have Madhu Shakar. Sadakar. Sorry, Madhu. Great to see you, my friend. Mr. Hunter, how are you? Awesome. Uh, happy Friday. How are you? Good, good. Happy Friday. I hope you are getting wine bottle for everybody here. <laughs> yes, sir. I must attend. Virtual. That's right. Yes, Virtual sir. Virtual wine. Awesome. Uh, hey, we are uh, known for uh, great wine at the uh, in-person events that we do throw. That's true. Yeah, I'm, uh, Andrew, I'm going to use some backdrop of uh, uh, a few slides to show what I want to convey to you today is, look, guys, um, uh, first of all, it's a happy Friday. The key thing that I want to get is we are in an age of increasing the experience. There are three platforms that are doing extremely well. That's what I look, I represent, I'm CEO of Isra. So what we are trying to do is, is to help people use Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and Slack. The employees and users are going to be increasingly on this. We are using Zoom platform here for hunters, right? For HMG. So people are going to be engaged in Zoom. People are going to be asking questions in Zoom. People want to perform their IT. The entire IT customer support, including agent, Sharad, even Observe.ai, their agents want to be living in this platform. They want to be in Zoom. They need solution like Isra. So what Isra does is to automate customer service, IT support, and I, the whole gamut of everything from workflow automation all the way to customer support. 
leverage this platform, guys. So experience is changing a lot. The employees are going to be in this platform. Now, earlier, Trevor talked about system of intelligence. I really believe in that. So, right, there's a system of intelligence and experience being added today. System of record, the SaaS is 20 years old. And if you talk to uh, CEO of ServiceNow, Bill McDonald, he's talking about hyper automation, right? The whole world is going towards automation. This is where the RPA, like Hunter added many RPA companies in the program. So RPAs are becoming conversations. It's like AI marries RPA, right? Imagine the best of the, you get the best NLP, best AI, best RPA, right? And add that to your SaaS applications, whether that's Zendesk, Salesforce, Workday. That is what is happening in the world of the market today is how can we drive these experiences to the next level? And ISRA is trying to solve these problems, either through system of intelligence or hyper automation for your customers and users and deliver the service on Zoom, on Slack, and on MS Teams. So there are three solutions that we offer today in marketplace, right? So this is what I'm here to talk on the panel. So from service desk all the way to operations, even the operations is automated, guys. Imagine if you're Amazon and YouTube or Google, they're not waiting for the developers to tell us when the DevOps problem is happening. You should be able to predict when there's a problem. That's the future. Future will be like earthquake prediction. Thank you, Hunter. I, I love the slides. Apologies, folks. Uh, it's a little unfair competitive advantage here in terms of uh, the bake-off, right? Uh, Life is always with, unfair, Hunter. But Life is Madu, never fair. Madhu came, came with slides. Um, we'll have to remember that for next time, uh, everyone. Uh, next up, we have AJ Sundar. Uh, good to see you, Sundar. Welcome. Hi, Hunter. Uh, Pleasure to meet you. I have to follow that, huh? You like what? Yeah. Hey, look, you're the CPO and CIO of RFPIO Inc. Um, how do you how do you announce that? The the name of the company. Yeah, it's uh, RFPIO, and uh, we went very literal. Uh, we started out as a RFP response. For those who don't know what an RFP is, it's a request for a proposal. And that's where we started, and hence the name. You know, we didn't get too creative with the name. We went RFP, input, output. Uh, but since then, we have really evolved into your know, response management solution. You know, if you have ever responded to an RFP, RFQ, RFI, or security questionnaire, vendor assessment, third-party risk assessment, it doesn't matter what you're responding to, whether it's a prospective client or an existing customer, you use our platform to quickly and efficiently respond and really through automation, content management and collaboration. So there's the whole platform. And that's, that's what we have evolved over the last four years since we launched. Okay. And the specific issue or problem you're addressing, Sundar? So, you know, if uh, RFPs tend to be in the olden days, when, when we, uh, before we launched, it used to be a highly manual process. And you keep repeating the same thing over and over again. It's almost the story is always the same. You have a deadline. It just, you know, coincidentally, just this morning, I received two questionnaires. One has about 400 questions. The deal is waiting for it. If until we complete it, our sales team cannot close the deal. We have to respond to security related, technology related, our architecture, so they can evaluate and say, thumbs up, you can go ahead and sign up with this vendor. And we have another one from an existing customer in our long questionnaire with about 700. Now, if without our application, it would probably take us a couple of weeks at least. And we didn't plan for it. You know, we, you, know, you don't really expect always, you know, opportunity does not always give you a heads up, right? You have to be prepared when it shows up. Uh, so that's really where our application platform comes in. You know, with, with our platform, basically, I don't get involved much. We have teams, they will run it through the automation and it will, the system will take care of a lot of the response and then they will go fill in the gaps. So that, that really saves us a lot of time. And Sundar, where are you in your form, uh, your funding? We are in uh, Beaverton, Oregon. So in, in terms of funding rounds? Oh, sorry, funding, yeah. So we, uh, sorry, I didn't quite hear your question. So we launched in 2016. We initially started with uh, some angel investment. Portland community was outstanding. You know, we had so much support from the local community, from investment community. So that's really how we started. And then a couple of years later, we 
crossover Series A round uh, with K1 Investments, and uh, and that's that's where we stand now from investment. Excellent, great, great to have you on the program, Center. Back to Michelle. Hey, Michelle, when you look at your company and the total addressable market, that's massive. Mm -hmm. um, what do you need now? What's your ideal prospect company client look like? Mm. And more broadly, what do you need now? How can uh, the HMG platform and network help you? Yeah, yeah, I would say, you know, our ideal profile are, are people who um, are building customer data lakes uh, and want to connect that information, segment scores, models, essentially into real time experiences, right? They don't, they don't, they want to have that data just sit there and kind of not deliver any ROI. Um, and, you know, I'd say the second kind of key component is, you know, most of our customers have fairly large data science teams. So they want us to take those models and operationalize them into those real time experiences. Uh, and then third, our sweet spot are really, you know, digital teams where some of the IT and the digital estate has been brought together. So they're not just thinking about, you know, uh, early front of the funnel experiences. We're really thinking about, you know, in when somebody's on the website, for example, struggling with adding a payee to their bank account, how do we trigger the chatbot? How do we send them over to maybe something like observe.ai where the call center can be massively more effective in, you know, getting them through that challenge and ideally to fund that bank account. So think about us really as essentially an invisible brain. If we do our job, you know, customers really don't know we're up and running. They just know that normally those, those teams and those channels are very siloed and all of a sudden their experience becomes kind of massively more friction, frictionless and personalized. So that's, that's kind of really who we're, we're focused on. I mean, I think, look, we're, you know, from, from a funding point, from a scale point of view, we're a little bit of a tweener, I would say. So we've raised about $50 million. You know, Andreessen did our A and Menlo did our B. Ben Horowitz is on the board. Um, but all my early adopters really are in that highly regulated industry. Think fintech, think healthcare, you know, help I would love. I'd love if there are visionaries or thought leaders out there who want to partner with us in hospitality or retail you know, this idea is coming to all verticals. So if there are folks out there that are in the middle of this challenge and either want to educate me and maybe there's going to be, you know, differences in my product or, or the, what I need to build, you know, I'm always looking for thought leaders to help us partner with us to build the right product. Um, you know, or certainly, you know, if there are folks out there who have specific challenges where, you know, maybe we can help, you know, would be delighted to kind of have those follow on conversations. But look, there's no great software company. It doesn't matter who you point to Salesforce. Um, you know, I, I worked at Mercury Interactive, you know, I, my last startup Aptio IPO, there's no great enterprise software company that doesn't become successful in partnership with visionary customers. We have ideas, you help us perfect them. Uh, you know, so the folks who believe in that, you know, would love to kind of get connected post this and, and learn from you. Hey, Michelle, thanks for coming to the program. Really thoughtful uh, presentation and, uh, wow, fascinating uh, a background in investors. That's awesome. Great job. Love to help you out in the future. Um, yeah, appreciate. thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity. And, I, and it's interesting to me, there's so much in common with all of us as presenters, this whole idea that, you know, everything's going to real time, this whole idea that everything is going to become more personalized and relevant. I, it's actually just fun for me to see all these fellow, uh, you know, founders tackling the same kind of concept I'm, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at, but, but, you know, same concept, event-driven, real-time, AI-driven, but solving different problems for customers. So really cool panel. Likewise, 100%, totally agree. Hey, Nikhil, um, back over to you. Uh, what's the ideal client or customer look like for you? So uh, our solution is very good for medium to large enterprises. Uh, we are talking to Fortune 10 all the way to you know $500 million companies. So any company who is doing software development and has, let's say, two to three application security engineers uh, so that the software is big enough that you need to secure them. And uh, uh, if you have like three to five different application security testing tools, uh, again, the solution could add value to even startups, but we are not focusing on day one. Uh, from ideal customer profile perspective, as I said, it's from 500 million to 50 billion. I know it's a pretty wide range, but uh, you know, people and even my fellow uh, party, uh, panel participants also can benefit from a solution like ours. But today as an early stage startup, we are primarily going after mid to large enterprises. Excellent stuff. And uh, when are you gonna be ready 
to take on more uh, uh, partners to uh, build out POCs and scale? Uh, we are ready. As I said, we just started the POC. We already have a few going on and uh, we have a room for a lot many more. The way we have built it is a SaaS platform, so it's easy to scale. Uh, we did, that's why uh, in my previous startup, you know, I had raised money from Angel and all. This time I went with the uh, venture capital raised from Sierra Ventures for the very same reason that hey, money is not an issue. So, you know, we are ready to take on if you are, uh, you know, building your or accelerating your digital transformation, or you want to secure your applications. Uh, typically, what we are showing to our customers of like a $5 billion company is around three to $5 million of saving. That's the reason, you know, a lot of companies are coming to us for POC and to Michelle's point, you know, of course there's no perfect product. We are engaging, we are using the design partner approach. Uh, you know, we have another, you know, uh, so probably like for another couple of months, we'll continue with the POC or beta and then we'll go GA shortly after that. So again, from customer perspective, more the merrier. And how can HMG help you? In the oh, they, you guys have been already helping a lot, Hunter. <laughs> so basically, you know, that marketplace, we are going to get onto the marketplace, so which is, a, I believe is a fantastic place for, you know, several CIO leaders and everybody else to come uh, and you, because you have, a curated set of companies, as Michelle said, even in the previous panel, you are handpicking the companies, which is very important. They are like, uh, for example, in security, there are 5,000 security startups and you chose us, right? So that speaks a lot that you are kind of uh, doing your diligence and everything else. So, and, and the best thing here is that you are providing value to both, right? So uh, one of the big challenge to our target customers, CIU and CISOs is they get inundated with the startups all the time, right? There are so many companies which want to go after. And in the same time from the startup perspective, we are looking for, especially in early stages, early adopter customers. Right, so so that's where we are looking forward to getting onto the marketplace. And uh, you know, Brian, uh, I don't know if he's there on the call or not. He has been super helpful. He has been basically helping us, kind of connect with a lot of people. And at this point, we are looking to, uh, you know, uh, Hunter. I'm from India, and a lot of Indian marriages are arranged marriage. So I see you as a, doing an arranged marriage between you know the buyers and the sellers, if you will. So fantastic job. Thanks, Nikhil. It's very funny. It's a an HMG moment there for sure. Um, Sharath, <laughs> you're up next. Thank you. You're up next. Uh, kind of uh, the ideal client and how can we help you get out there? Absolutely. I think I have a very controversial internal definition for an ICP, an ideal customer profile, right? So uh, my, my thing is uh, we a, a, a big factor of our growth has been to figure out who we can help and who we cannot, right? Uh, so essentially what I tell internally is, hey, Think about an enterprise company with an AI enthusiast CXO who, who's, who has this fear of missing out on the AI wave, but does not trust his team to actually implement an AI pro project is, is my ideal customer, right? Uh, yes, there is a capital one in the banking industry who will always be cutting edge to go after everything on AI innovation, but then there is another 500 other banking customers across this world who probably does not have the team to build and develop and deliver an AI solution. So for me and my team, uh, those are the companies we actually go and look for where uh, everybody can think about building an information extraction layer, right? But it's, a, it's the workflow that makes the difference. And we chose a very simple workflow. The first message you hear when you call a call center is this call is being recorded for training quality and compliance purposes. We said we'll automate those three functions and do it really, really well. Uh, in almost a zero code, no code kind of a format so that uh, any enterprise can come in, go live in 24 to 48 hours and use the product, right? So it's essentially AI in action. Uh, we call it visible AI internally. Uh, and, and that's what we go and look for customers. And, and I think uh, when I looked at HMG and, and the kind of CIOs who are a part of your panel who actually be a part of HMG, that's where we actually thought uh, uh, we can be a great partner. And, uh, and I think uh, as Michelle and Muddu and everybody have been talking about, uh, I think all of us in this panel, we could not have started a technology company at a better time than this. So there's like a trifecta of events, digital transformation, cloud migration, AI transformation happening in the same time. And COVID has actually accelerated this whole thing from two uh, uh, events uh, in a year, which used to be Cyber Monday and Black Friday, which would drive the most number of customer interactions. This year there has been 127, right? So 
we just plain dumb lucky of starting an ai company in this time uh, and and we would like to uh, we would uh, look forward to hmd to help us scale this from here yeah how can we help shraf because we're out there every week every day we do a million impressions worldwide on our digital platform uh let's do a follow up call love to have you a uh, part of my ceo club founder club as well as uh seeing how hmd can help you scale out and power up great job absolutely and and we've been in a very uh, uh passive mode so far and and i think uh, we are look, looking at forums like this to kind of announce ourselves we've raised 90 million dollars we have 150 customers but we've never marketed i had my first marketing person 3 months ago so uh, i think now it's the time to go out to the market and announce ourselves and we look for hmg and this platform to take us to the market that's brilliant thanks so much appreciate the vote of confidence hey sundar why don't you take it home for us uh thoughts on uh, your total addressable market how can we help um uh in some sex successes yeah so uh you know when we started out we specifically targeted the smb market you know that was our focus initially but you know similar to shot we didn't really uh go do a lot of outbound but it was a lot of inbound target one of the strengths of for us is our product is pretty agnostic vertical industry vertical agnostic we have customers in technology healthcare banking manufacturing finance services you name it we have customers across the globe it's not geographical we have customers in every continent but antarctica as we do and when we look at the size of co- companies that we serve we have customers in fortune 10 like amazon google microsoft salesforce and a couple of our panelists today broadridge and bring central but we also have customers that are startups that are about a year or two old that have less than 50 people so we we currently serve a whole range of the market a whole range of customer profile really anyone any customer especially in like technology companies i talked about security questionnaires vendor assessment and risk assessment or if, if even if you don't receive our fees our platform has a solution for those kind of organizations so any kind of connections in this is a great platform i'm new to hmg but just looking at and listening to the platform to the conversations on the panel today i think you can be a great partner for us in the as we started out with the initial internal contact in portland but as we grew now we are about a thousand customers in the last four years and we have about 120,000 users uh, but really there is there's a huge opportunity in front of us that total addressable market for us is some ridiculous number i don't even mention anymore so we we tend to focus on you know baby steps even at this stage well, you know thanks under i got to tell you uh, all four of you really really blew me away in terms of a uh, quality of presentation uh madhu did we skip over you by accident oh that no worries uh, it's always good so i think from my side i think um, hunter look um, the mark i think that if you look at the what's happening in the marketplace right um, ai i think as uh, michel mentioned um, uh, there is a lot of things going on in the market but the key thing is ai is going to really fundamentally change um it, there are some cup winners will come out out of this covid as a thrive some people will not thrive some people will survive so i think the key is to bet on automation and ai and that's going to change the game uh, i don't know if you guys saw today snap actually acquired a voice agent company in ai from israel this snapchat consumer company snapchat getting into sharad your business area right so they are going to say look people are going to be in snapchat people are going to be doing the agent should not be spending time closing calls so the world is going to change whatsapp snap twitter the people are going to the eyeballs are there's only so many hours people got 24 hours so what michel talked with user mind or what isra we are doing so all these guys are we are all going after people's time to be make it efficient so that they can spend there with their families take care of their health but not doing this mundane task so that's where the whole rt and ai is going to happen extremely well um i think hmd man hunter you do a great job so look keep doing this event maybe you should do one event every day 365 days i think you are doing only 50, uh, one per week let's do every week every day right uh, i can see this we could do a founder panel we could do the innovation accelerator we did one earlier this week one hour program and it was awesome literally awesome because of the 
the brilliant entrepreneurs like you all, four of you, and myself and our audience that are really thirsty for this kind of uh, thought leadership and content and connection, we should seriously look at that. Maybe do a follow-up call next week with this team right here to ideate how to do, how to do that and roll it across uh, the year. That would be a great idea. Big and Bill, under- great job. Hey, Michelle, final word. Great time to be a technology professional, right? Best time ever. Mm-hmm. Best time ever. I mean, look, COVID's, it's like the best of times, the worst of times. I thought, you know, there was a point in Q2 where I'm sure all of us wondered if our companies would go out of business. Maybe Sharath is the only one who uh, didn't have that feeling. I mean, that was, it's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but look, I mean, COVID is the single biggest accelerator to digital and, and kind of our customers digitally engaging in all respects that we've seen in our lifetime. Um, There's no company I talk to that hasn't accelerated their innovation. You know, I hear things like what took us 10 years we did in, you know, three months, four months, five months. So um, I think when companies, when our customers, they're, you know, transforming and accelerating, that's just, you know, a tailwind for all of us who are sitting here at this, uh, at this table. So I think the next 18 months are going to be fun. Brilliant stuff. Hey, Michelle, thanks so much for coming on the program. Nikhil, Sharath, Madhu, Sunder, awesome job. Looking forward to following up with you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank Thank you you so much. Great. Uh, Hey, what a great summit. Um, One last piece here. Stay with us. One last thing, right? A famous Steve Jobs quote. Just one last thing here. No, we have the HMG Top Technology Executives Who Matter uh, Recognition Program. We've been running this for 14 years. August Plicho is uh, our key social media marketing exec. August, you want to come to the stage, please, hey, and there. kickstart the presentation. Uh, we have three really interesting individuals. They all three, I think, have uh, interesting videos. August, take it away, and I'll jump back in at the end. Hey, Hunter, thanks for uh, handing it over, and and thanks everybody for staying until the very end of the program here to help us celebrate these three great individuals. Uh, what a what an incredible summit! Our first time ever in Portland, right, Hunter? Absolutely. Today, we're going to recognize three distinct individuals, three technology leaders that deserve to be a household name in Portland, three invaluable partners to the HMG community. Uh, These individuals have all been instrumental in expanding our horizons to the Portland region and all serve with passion, pride, and deliberation to lead the Portland Sim chapter. Um, These three individuals are Pradeep Kumar, Sabi Warach, and Richard Appleyard. So if the three of you could join us on the screen, we're gonna start by recognizing Pradeep. Hi Pradeep, how are you today? Uh, here, here you all are, I see you. So first up today is Pradeep Kumar. Pradeep Kumar is a practice leader at Kaiser Permanente. His function at Kaiser focuses on enterprise mobile wireless infrastructure spearheading developments for next-gen 4G and 5G solution delivery. He's been an active and passionate leader with SIM Portland, backing initiatives such as the Leadership Mentoring Program, SIM Women, and their CIO Roundtable. He's served in various roles, including chapter president, now serves as trustee. Uh, He led the collaboration with local universities on the SIM Portland Scholarship Award Program that focus on building the supply line for future talents in the information field. His leadership style has guided the leaders of tomorrow, uh, making the IT world a more efficient and more prepared industry. Pradeep, congratulations on earning yourself and your team this award. Thank you very much. And uh, I have said that award, it's not just me, it's the all the volunteers and the passion. I think, I think uh, you know, it was alluded earlier at the beginning of the talk, uh, I'm very fortunate to be in Portland, where we have uh, a very passionate and enthusiastic uh, group of volunteers who are willing to take that extra, you know, go the extra mile to uh, deliver, right? Uh, uh, to make, you know, the same chapter uh, a very exciting community. Thank you. Congratulations, Pradeep. Uh, w- really appreciate your helping launching year one summit with you all uh, and your passion for SIM and uh, what an amazing company you work for at Kaiser. 
with brilliant leadership. Uh, you're really a star. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we're going to recognize Sabi, Sabi Varach, uh, CIO and CISO for Clackamas Community College. Um, the category that uh, Sabi is winning in today is best dressed. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sabi is a, a passionate as a keynote speaker and a leadership coach, uh, workshopping strategies to foster leadership and success for upper, upper level IT management and executives. Uh, Sabi says, good managers take responsibility for their decisions. They listen and are able to motivate employees and inspire them with their own vision. They are leaders that people like to follow. Most importantly though, Sabi is a hands-on leader with the Sim Portland chapter. His accolades speak for themselves, but his peers, colleagues, and team congratulate him with high regard. Uh, let's roll a little video from Sabi's team here. So we see we have Richard here. Richard Appleyard is the CIO for the Oregon State Police, but also the president of the Portland Sim Chapter. Uh, Richard worked to support all the digital transitions of his CIO events uh, for Oregon during the pandemic. He's also worked to encourage growth of the chapter and supporting scholarships for students pursuing business technology and information science degrees. Uh, Richard's years in consulting helped strengthen his perspective of aligning business goals with technology and IT strategy, something he applies with pride today. And Richard is an advocate for taking action, making a difference, and communicating as a leader. Uh, we also put together a short clip that we hope will introduce you uh, to the way that we've gotten to know Richard recently. And uh, we'll work on pulling that up in a moment here. gives you an insight to your blind spots um, that allows you to take action that can really make a difference in how you uh, communicate and how you lead uh, your team or your organization. Congratulations, Richard, and thank, <laughs> thank all of you for helping us put this together. Thank you, August. Oh, it's just phenomenal, and I, I really appreciate um, uh, the acknowledgement. And and again, I think I'll, I'll echo what Pradeep said. It's it's just a phenomenal team of um, volunteers we have at the chapter, and and coming in as the new president, it's been my pleasure to have a really um, exciting and engaged. Uh, board. I've got uh, Pradeep with a deep depth of knowledge, and I've got Sabi with his uh, excellent marketing skills and selfie Sabi's getting the word out about organizations. So um, yeah, it's it's a great team. 
and again, you know, I couldn't do it without them. It's really, uh, really um, a privilege to to lead them. Hey, Richard, great to meet you. Really loved my team, and I loved. I love working with you and pulling this together with Sabi and Pradeep. Uh, our first summit together, I thought it was a huge success. Your leadership style is really very bright and evident to me in everything that you do. So and thoughtful. Appreciate it very much. Um, and by the way, Sabi, you do get the best dressed uh, HMG uh, Thought Leader <laughs> Award of the Year uh, for sure. We need to know your tailor or your uh, where you're where you're getting those threads. Yeah, again, Richard, Sabi, Rudy, great working with you. Great working with the whole chapter. Hope you all enjoyed today's mutual collaboration summit. Many more to come, hopefully. Uh, big shout out to the, again the Portland Sim chapter. It's a great organization. Ring Central, Sarah, our speakers, panelists, uh, and keynotes. Um, everyone, be safe, uh, be well. And we look forward to uh, connecting soon. Take Thank care. You. See you. Thanks, Santa. Cheers.